So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Tracy McKay, who is part of the Caribou program here at FRI Research. Tracy uh, has completed a BSc in Environmental Science at the University of Northern BC and an MSc in Environmental Management from Royal Roads University, where her thesis research focused on caribou behavioral response to hikers in Jasper National Park. Since completing her master's degree, Tracy has worked for the FRI Research Grizzly Bear Program and Parks Canada in Jasper before starting with the FRI Research Caribou Program in 2016. Tracy believes strongly in conservation and she can be found outside in her natural habitat whenever she gets the chance. So I am pleased to introduce you to Tracy McKay and her presentation. Tracy, over to you. Thanks, Terry. I'm just going to turn my camera on for 30 seconds, maybe. Hi, everyone. Uh, just so that you can tell that I am a real person speaking to you live from my home in Jasper. Uh, and I just wanted to thank all of you for attending this morning. Uh, so today I'm presenting some research we've been working on for a while at FRI, and it's kind of two different parts of a project looking at predators and landscape features associated with predation in uh, central mountain caribou herds. So I'm going to turn my camera off again now, now that you know I'm here, and you can focus on the slides. So I want to start off by thanking my collaborators, including Brian Macbeth, Barry Nobert, Karen Pigeon, Terry Larson, and Laura Finnegan. And <clears throat> I also want to begin with a little bit of background on predation risk and predator prey dynamics. So apologies to those in the audience who have heard this story thousands of times before, but as a caribou biologist, I often get questions like, you know, wolves and caribou have lived together for a long time. Why are we now saying that wolves are killing too many caribou? And this is a valid question because obviously uh, in natural systems like this one, uh, <clears throat> predator and prey species have evolved together in a way that has allowed them to coexist. So, but when we add some anthropogenic disturbance to this landscape, maybe we cut down some trees, we change the vegetation community, we add some linear features like roads, seismic lines, pipelines, we end up with altered predator prey dynamics. This can happen in a bunch of different ways. Um, maybe you get an increase in a prey population because they prefer the new forage that is growing. As a result, you might get an increase in the predator population. Uh, maybe you change the way the predators and prey species move around on the landscape with the features that have been developed there. And so when we're talking about caribou, because <laughs> that's what I'm supposed to be talking about, uh, caribou are a species that have evolved, at least in our central mountain populations, at relatively low densities with relatively little spatial overlap with other prey species. So if you make those changes on the landscape, you add in those alternate prey species, uh, in this case, a large increase in the local roadrunner population, but could just as easily be, uh, could just as easily be deer, moose, or elk. Uh, maybe that brings in more predators. And in the caribou world, we talk about this problem, problem excuse me, as the apparent competition issue where caribou in this case are kind of killed as a, a side effect. These predators are coming into this landscape because of these other prey species. And in addition to that, we know that we've changed how predators are using the landscape within caribou habitat maybe facilitating their access, allowing them to move faster. And the result is we get an increased predation risk for caribou. So we know that in a lot of caribou ranges in Western Canada, there is a lot of anthropogenic disturbance. A lot of it looks like this, seismic lines, pipelines, well sites. And in fact, uh, these unnatural high predation rates that resulting from habitat alteration are currently considered to be one of the biggest threats for central mountain caribou. But in spite of this kind of established link between predation risk 
and disturbance, there's still a number of knowledge gaps, especially in our study area. So which predators are involved in this predation risk and which disturbance features are kind of most important or what are the relationships between specific disturbance features like roads, seismic lines, pipelines, and caribou predation events. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this led us to our research objectives. The first one being we wanted to look at the role of different predator species and caribou predation mortalities. And then we wanted to look at how or whether specific anthropogenic linear features were directly associated with increased caribou predation risk. And when I say directly associated, we wanted, <clears throat> so there's a lot of previous research that shows how predators use linear features on the landscape. And there is a lot of kind of indirect evidence of this predation risk, but we wanted to know are caribou mortalities on the ground directly associated with some of these linear features? And we focused on linear features because that is the current focus of a lot of habitat restoration uh, activities in our study area. And at FRI Research, we're always looking at what the underlying uh, land management implications might be. So the end goal is we want to provide information to help focus caribou habitat restoration in areas that might have the highest predation risk. So our study area included the ranges of the Narraway and Red Rock Prairie Creek Central Mountain caribou populations. This is in East Central British Columbia and West Central Alberta, and also within the traditional lands of the Sinuichi Winnowak, Dakel, Metis, Seklepum, and Tsutsina peoples. And when you look closer at this study area, you can see there is quite a lot of linear quite a lot of linear disturbance features in this study area. Uh, it kind of looks like this on the ground. So cut box, well sites, roads, seismic lines, you name it. So to look at caribou predation, we used GPS collared adult female caribou. We had data from 2008 to 2015. And the collars were programmed so that after eight hours of that caribou not moving, it would send a mortality signal. And in the earlier years, this was not detected until someone did a telemetry flight in a fixed wing airplane. But in the more recent years, we would get a direct message from the satellite. And how it seems to work with these satellite messages is that, uh, first of all, the caribou die when Laura is on holidays. Uh, the text messages come in the middle of the night so that you can wake up to your phone glowing and see that a caribou has died. But my favorite were the email messages because they start like this. Oops, excuse me. Uh, so it kind of reminds me of the message that you get when your package is shipping from Amazon. And it's great because uh, you know one of your collared animals has died but you feel like you're getting really great customer service. So we went to 37 mortality sites and we tried to go there as soon as we could after getting that mortality signal, but that wasn't always possible. So within 24 hours, if we could, if not, as soon as we could get there. And when we got there, we were trying to figure out what the cause of death was and if it was a predation caused death, who was the probable predator? So we were looking for things like puncture wounds, bite marks, hide peeling, any sign of predators. Um, and in the field, if possible, we did a necropsy, or if not, sometimes we brought the caribou back to the office. And sometimes we had really great evidence of a predation caused mortality. In this case, this was a predation caused by a wolf, and you can see where the red arrow is pointing. Um, there's anti-mortem or before death hemorrhaging around this wound. So we know for sure that this caribou was killed by predation because it died. These, these injuries were caused before it died. Sometimes we were just looking for characteristic patterns of different predators. Um, intact skulls are typical of cougar kills. Sheared hair is typical of cougar. Uh, wolves tend to scatter the bones all about. Uh, rip the carcasses apart, um, open up the bones. 
And grizzly bears often peel the hide, or sometimes we found scat full of caribou, bear scat full of caribou hair and bones. And then sometimes there was no sign of predation, or it was obvious that something else killed the caribou. This is a caribou that Laura nicknamed Cliffaboo because it fell 800 meters from a cliff and uh, slid to the bottom of this slope. So we know for sure, uh, we feel pretty sure that a predator did not kill this caribou. Uh, other times we have no idea. Uh, the caribou was found completely intact. In these cases, we tried to collect health samples. And sometimes we just got there too late. So we found a collar or scattered bones or hair, but there really was no way to know what had happened. So of those 37 site visits, 18 of those had really good evidence of predation and 19 either we knew for sure it wasn't predation or we just didn't know. And of those 18, three of them we could attribute to cougars, four to wolves, six to grizzly bears, and at five of those there was sign from multiple predators so we just couldn't tell who got there first. So this was really interesting information to us because in Alberta especially a lot of research has focused on wolves in terms of caribou predation but it's really important to remember that we're in a multi-predator system here. So moving on to the second part of uh, looking at the analysis of the anthropogenic linear features and caribou predation risk. Again, we took those 18 predation caused caribou mortalities we can see here on the map. And we wanted to know what was going on on the landscape where those predation caused mortalities took place. So we wanted to look at landscape features at the mortality location. We also know that caribou habitat used prior to being killed can influence their exposure to predators and maybe even their exposure to specific predators. So we also looked at habitat used prior to mortalities during the 24 hours, seven days and 30 days before those caribou were killed by predators. So we took those mortality locations and the GPS locations from those non-surviving caribou, which we ended up calling uh, doomed to die. And we paired those locations with GPS locations from surviving caribou, also known as hard to kill. And we paired them specifically within the same time period and the same herd ranges. And those data went into a conditional logistic regression, so a case control analysis where the doomed to die were the case and the hard to kill were the control. But we know that it's not just anthropogenic linear features that influence predation risks. So we also looked at a bunch of terrain and habitat variables. And we ran a bunch of models. We did a multi-step model selection process, looking at a number of spatial scales for each variable. And we ran those models for those four spatial temporal scales. So at the kill site and locations, prior to the mortalities during the 30 days, seven days, and 24 hours. And one more thing I should note is that uh, we had locations both within and outside of protected areas, but the, as you can see on this map, the density of linear features is pretty drastically different uh, within the green versus outside of the green. So we ended up splitting our data sets into mortalities that took place within protected areas and those that took place outside. So in our final models, we ended up with a bunch of variables and I'm just going to focus on the linear feature variables outside of protected areas since those have the most implications for habitat restoration. So we found that prior to being killed during the 30 and seven days before those caribou were killed by predation, they were more likely to be close to pipelines. And with seismic lines, uh, during any habitat use prior to being killed, they were more likely to be close to seismic lines. But kind of surprisingly, in terms of roads, we found that caribou that were doomed to die were actually farther from roads than those surviving caribou during the 30 days prior to being killed. So when we look more closely at those results, there is a lot of previous research showing that predators use these linear features for movement and hunting and foraging. So this isn't a big surprise. Uh, but again, this is now direct evidence that caribou are killed if they spend more time 
closer to seismic lines and pipelines. And we're kind of excited about the pipeline results because as far as we know, this is the first almost published research that shows this relationship between predation risk and pipelines. So back to those road results, this is a little bit opposite of what we were expecting because there's a lot of previous research out there showing that predators use roads for travel. So you would expect predation risk to increase near roads and we found the opposite. But the roads in our study area are fairly high use. There's a lot of logging truck traffic and oil and gas companies regularly drive these roads to service all the well sites in the area. So <clears throat> there is also a lot of previous research out there that shows predators will actually avoid roads if there's a lot of human use in the area. So we think that this might be happening in our area, in our area where predation risk is actually lower near roads because predators are avoiding them. Uh, within protected areas, same thing, we ended up with a number of variables in our final models. And I'm just going to focus on sort of the most consistent results and those with coefficients that have confidence intervals not overlapping zero. So in other words, ones where we kind of know the direction of the effect. So within protected areas, we found that those doomed to die caribou spent more time were closer, sorry, to alpine habitat prior to being killed than their surviving counterparts. And also they were farther from forest edges. We think these two results are related. And in fact, we did find we had mortalities occurring in the alpine. And there is some research out there that shows that when caribou use alpine areas to avoid predators, especially wolves, they may be more vulnerable to other predators. So in our case, this would be cougars and grizzly bears. So although there's other research out there showing that caribou may use alpine areas as a refuge from predators, our results are suggesting the, the opposite. In other words, from certain predators at least, um, predation risk may actually be increasing in these areas. So Kind of the take home messages from all of this, uh, we definitely need to consider multiple predators when we're looking at predation risk, especially in our study area. And it was nice to find this direct evidence that pipelines and seismic lines were associated with a higher likelihood of caribou being killed by predators. And our results suggested to us that it's really important to look at this habitat use prior to mortalities, as well as what's going on at the kill sites. There were a number of results that we would not have detected if we had only looked at the kill sites. And this makes sense. Uh, what the caribou does before it dies probably affects its likelihood of being killed. And it also looked to us like the influence of the linear features on caribou predation risk really depended on what kind of linear feature we were talking about. In other words, the results we got with pipelines and seismic lines were quite different than what we saw with roads. So what does this mean for habitat and caribou conservation? Definitely points to mitigations and restoration of linear features as being a good idea. This is not a new idea. Um, this has been identified as a pretty high priority for Alberta at least. And although it's not possible to restore pipelines because they are regularly cleared, uh, companies need access to those oil and gas pipelines, uh, it is possible to install mitigations that could reduce predator travel speeds or just try to reduce predator use of those features. And again, we're hoping that this research helps prioritize or focus what areas might be restored within caribou habitat. Uh, in other words, restore the areas with the highest predation risk because uh, at the moment there are hundreds of thousands of kilometers of linear features in Alberta and British Columbia that could be restored. So it's likely that this will need to be prioritized somehow to have the best influence. And with that, I'd like to thank all of our partners and financial supporters. And I think I kind of blew through that a bit quickly, but uh, I guess it's time to open up to questions.